Good evening, everyone. Welcome uh, this evening to Museum London. Uh, I'm Diane Pierce, and I'm curator of public programs here at the museum. Um, tonight marks our third collaboration with two other entities from Western uh, University, the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities and Public Humanities at Western. We have joined forces uh, to create something called Public Matters, uh, the Public Matters Speaker <coughs> Series. Uh, and the objective of that speaker series um, is to connect campus with community um, through these kinds of interdisciplinary projects. Uh, for our folks at Western, this encourages students to work in closer contact uh, with the public, and, uh, with the public and its institutions as well as the London community. Um, and on this end, here at Museum London, um, the audience gets to enjoy the opportunity of hearing from and engaging with prominent individuals from various uh, disciplines and backgrounds. Uh, so it's very exciting and also enriching um, to champion this spirit of citizenship and engagement. Um, in the past, we've had um, other speakers, and tonight we are obviously welcoming Jillian uh, Kylie, and we'll get to her in just a moment. Um, to give you a bit, a bit of background about the three groups that um, come together and partner on this initiative, um, we have the School for Advanced Studies in the Arts and Humanities, and they are a flagship of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at Western University. And that school is directed by Dr. Joel Faflak, who is here in the audience with us. Um, it's a relatively new program, and it's very interesting in that it's a hybrid initiative um, that focuses on experiential learning, but without, lear without losing the scholarly uh, research behind it all. So it's very innovative. Um, the new, this program offers an interdisciplinary education and a, a cross-cultural um, education as well. Um, our other, the other group that we work with is Public Humanities at Western, um, and they are committed to the campus community collaboration as well. And I might even, you know, credit this particular group with um, hitting the streets uh, four or five years ago, knocking on our door and saying, hey, let's work together on something. So that's how it all got started. Um, it is run by a team effort of graduate students, um, and two of its members have collaborated on this particular talk tonight, and they are um, Joel Burton and Josh Lambier. Um, their goal is to renew that spirit of citizenship and engagement uh, through arts and humanities, so a common goal. And of course, that leads Museum London. Uh, many of you have been here before, but if you have not, if this is your first um, opportunity to get here, we are um, the leading establishment in the region for um, collecting and presenting both art and history. So we have a double mandate. Um, and also through programming and events like this one, uh, we can promote um, knowledge, the knowledge of and uh, enjoyment of regional art, culture, and history. Um, for the, um, the museum on this team, I am one of the team members, as is our director, Brian Meehan. So those are your um, team members to bring this Public Matters speaker series together each year. I'm going to now pass the microphone over to Joel Burton, and he's going to do um, a little, he has the honor of introducing Jillian Kiley tonight, um, and uh, he will entertain you with, his, uh, with a little bit of background information on her and other things. On February 1st of this year, celebrated Newfoundland poet Mary Dalton took to the airwaves to speak with Sheila Rogers on CBC's The Next Chapter, claiming the ghost of Irish English, uh, I Irish English is present in Newfoundland, something we should take note of today of all days. To make her point, Dalton continues to share an exchange she had with a passerby while she was throwing salt on her front step that morning. Understanding hospitality, perhaps better than anyone on earth, those from Newfoundland, except, and I'm from Cape Breton, I dare to say one island over. Maybe. 
You can pick on me later, Julian. Dalton traces out the embellishment of storytelling in Newfoundland English that bears the trace of the oral tradition from Ireland. But before I get away from the topic of neighboring islands, another joke. I called my dad on this one, and I think it goes something like this. What do you call a Newfoundlander headed for Ontario who didn't make the 401? A Cape Bretoner. <laughs> Again, my apologies. So back to Mary Dalton's front step. Responding to the weather, the passerby says, lots of ice which compels Dalton to respond, lots of ice, sure enough. Note the embellishment. Because in Newfoundland, she informs us, following the rules of Irish hospitality, it's rude to answer with just a bald yes. In Newfoundland, every exchange, as far as I know, is an opportunity for story. It's no surprise then, in a tradition that so profoundly values the human exchange of stories, that our keynote speaker, Gillian Kiley, Artistic Director of English Theatre for the National Arts Centre in Ottawa, is from that place, is from those people, and from that very rich tradition of regional theatre that sprung up there in the 20th century. And I would argue that this rich tradition of Newfoundland theatre the likes of which have given us the work of artistic fraud theater, which Gillian founded. And in 2014, we might happily recall that Grand Theater stage was graced with oil and water, directed by our guest speaker, and written by her guest, Mr. Chafe here in the front row. We should also note that the wonder mix of comedy and hospitality that characterizes Newfoundland has also given us the satire of Rick Mercer, the comedy epitomized by Mary Walsh and Kathy Jones of CBC's This Hour as 22 Minutes. And earlier, the beloved Codco. Any fans of Codco? Yeah. <laughs> so that was short for Cod Company, a favorite of my parents, obviously. And it aired in half hour blocks back to back with Ontario's own Kids in the Hall. But before national claim, Codco was a comedic troupe out of Newfoundland that grew directly out of the thriving arts ecosystem of the 1960s and 1970s in what has been dubbed the cultural renaissance of Newfoundland. And this is the part that brings it to this lecture. This renaissance, arguably, only took hold after the Extension Department at Memorial University came together to collaborate with the local arts community and the National Film Board to produce the documentary films now known worldwide as the Fogo Process Films. We also know, and I've recently learned, that acclaimed performer Greg Malone from Newfoundland co-founded Codco after having worked on the Fogo films as an intern, where he learned the skills that changed not only the landscape of Newfoundland's comedy, but also the face of national performance across Canada. The rest is history, but what can we take from this moment in Newfoundland's cultural history? We should carefully think about it now is that the very innovation, call it social or otherwise, that our Minister of Canadian Heritage, Melanie Jolie, this week and today in Montreal, is speaking about across the country in response to Canada's 150th anniversary coming in 2017. What we can learn from this is that the potent combination of local arts groups working hand in hand with the post-secondary institutions of this or any city can imagine a better, more innovative future, which is to say a more inclusive, accessible, and democratic future where we can learn from one another. So today for this lecture, a core group from the Arts and Humanities of Western have joined Museum London to invite you here to listen to a gifted arts leader 
because we believe in London and we want to see the arts continue to flourish here. And nothing's new there because, as we know, some of the most celebrated pieces of art in our nation hang on the walls in the exhibition just outside this lecture hall. And they were created at a very important moment in London's cultural history, popularly known as London Regionalism. And I think London Regionalism was the answer to the cultural renaissance of Newfoundland that encouraged the people of that place to establish a distinct regional identity akin to the one here. Earlier today, Gillian told us, in my head, I still live in Newfoundland. I believe that it feeds me. Originally from St. John's, Gillian founded the theater company Artistic Fraud in 1995. Over the past 20 years, the company has come to be hailed as one of English Canada's most daring and innovative companies. The works of Artistic Fraud and its creators, director Gillian Kiley and Robert Chafe, have played across the country to high acclaim, and they've garnered Gillian the 2004 Suminovich Prize for Directing, and Robert the 2010 Governor General's Literary Award for Drama. Since their inception, the company has been developing a unique brand of choral stage work, the goal of which is deeply rooted in the theatrical possibilities of ensemble performance. With often minimal setting, props, and technical elements, the ensemble course is given full reign and responsibility for all visual and oral elements. Though carefully plotted and meticulously assembled, the goal of the work is the effortlessly organic. It's a performer-driven stage where spectacle meets story. It is my honor to invite our guest speaker, Gillian Kiley, to the podium. Very nice. He said everything I was going to say, so I'll just see you. <laughs> because really, it's all true. And I only just learned about London regionalism, but I'm going to talk about it in my speech. Um, so, every, hi, it's really nice to be in London. Um, uh, Frederick, uh, is, Frederick Bant Banting is uh, born here, as you know. Uh, Ryan Gosling uh, grew up here. It's the hometown of Emma Donahue, uh, Rachel McAdams, and Tom McCannis. Uh, and local, local music maven Sarah Smith lives here too. Not too bad for local, hey? But when you're actually in London, does it matter which part of London Ryan Gosling is from? I grew up in a place called the Goulds. An unusual number of artists come from there. It's a pretty small town. Governor General Award winning playwright Robert Chafe is also from the Goulds, specifically the back line. Alan Doyle, the lead singer of Great Big Sea, uh, went to school in the Goulds, but that's only because neighboring Petty Harbor didn't have a high school. <laughs> and Republic of Doyle's Alan Hawko is from the Goulds, except for really he's not, he's from Belle Island, and he moved to the Goulds when he was six. Best-selling author Wayne Johnson is from the Goulds, and he grew up just up the road from me, but on all of his books, his bio says he's from St. John's. When he's in St. John's, though, I bet he says he's from the Goulds. And it's about where you come from and what is your local. Is it a province, a city, a neighborhood, a bedroom for a teenager, a belly for a baby? Are you connected to it and are you proud of it? I get to thinking about what's local a lot. I travel a great deal and when I'm in St. John's, I'm from the Goulds. Like Wayne, when I'm in Ottawa, I'm from St. John's. When I'm in Ireland, I'm from Canada. When I was in Italy, I was complimented to no end on the work of Quebecois theater god, Robert Lepage. <laughs> I took it. <laughs> sure, I said, we all do work like that. Our local shrinks and expands according to where we are within it. Nationalism, regionalism, it's all tribal. It leads to sins of pride and acts of war. But it seems impossible to unhook yourself from the burrs of the paths and streets and forests that you walked in your youth. It is where you are from. 
and it helps others identify where you are coming from. In the 1980s, we saw a cultural revolution, that renaissance you were talking about, take place in Newfoundland. Our generation were eyewitnesses instead of protagonists, but we were too young to have anything to do with anything, but we were old enough to remember square rolling pins and mugs with the handles on the inside. We knew about the Newfie joke. We all thought they were funny too, until we realized that the joke was on us. We realized later the marketing impossibility of a Newfie Attorney General, a Newfie Prime Minister, and a Newfie member of the Supreme Court. The Newfoundland Cultural Revolution came from the inside, and it was led by the artists. As opposed to a shame-based rejection of our backcountry ways, it manifested as a celebration of our unique and joyful heritage. Musicians visited tiny harbors to collect almost forgotten tunes, and theater companies started reconstructing versions of traditional children's stories, once told around the kitchen, now envisioned for the stage. What had once embarrassed us became legitimate, and now we study the work of our fiddlers and wild poets in universities. High schools instituted a course called Newfoundland Culture that taught us about rug hooking, traditional songs and stories, and how to bottle partridge. We punched back at the derisive view of our people and our place on the climate map. What once was Canada's desolate arsehole became its shining navel, a navel that we Newfoundlanders now spend hours looking into. <laughs> During the beginnings of this revolution in the 1980s, we began to recognize the value of our own culture. We defended it. We got defensive about it. And it wasn't just the professional artists who wanted to reconnect. People all over <coughs> rediscovered the accordion and fiddle, and others learned the old dances that were cropping up at weddings and brand new destinations for tourist buses. This is a recording of a traditional Newfoundland set dance. You'll see that kind of dance in other cultures too. Uh, Jewish traditions have it, Kaylee's. This particular dance is called Running the Goat, and this part in particular, called Thread the Needle, thrills the director in me. Long lines of held hands, partners violently rushing under pairs of bridging arms. I know that probably everybody here who remembers the Meech Lake Accord is tired of hearing about distinctively cultured Newfoundlanders. I get that. I am too. But it's an important part of the story of what your local is, who your people are, where your culture lies, and it's not particularly about land. It's important to add that, except for the indigenous peoples in the audience, none of us are from this place either. Six generations back, I'm from County Cork, both sides. But when I was there with a show a few years ago, I was from Canada. Me running through the streets of Cork with my arms out crying, my people did not win me the relations I was anticipating. <laughs> and I think people, me too, are kind of tired about hearing about those distinctively cultured Newfoundlanders because we think, my God, people, you're a member of the Federation. You're doing all right. You, all, you speak some sort of English, for God's sake. At least Quebec has a language and a legacy of great artists to protect. <laughs> We're so friggin' comfortable that we forget. It's within, living memory, it's within living memory that we were a country. It's within living memory that our ties to Boston and Dublin were stronger than our ties to Toronto. It's within living memory that we had our own national anthem. We still sing it. It was written by a Brit, by the way. <laughs> but we're easy to get along with that way. You see, Newfoundland was the only dominion in history to give up its nationhood voluntarily. One of those volunteering was my grandmother, Josephine Kennedy, known as Mrs. Jost. Mrs. Jost was one of Joey Smallwood's strongest supporters, and she campaigned ferociously for him. Smallwood is the man whom 48% of the population believed sold the country of Newfoundland to Canada for a penny, and in return we got all the pride we could swallow. Mrs. Jost, I'm sure, had no fantasy about the true North strong and free, but she had seen the very worst of times as many Newfoundlanders, First Nations, Canadians, and people all over had at the turn of the century. 
There were many days of going hungry in Mrs. Joseph's house when she was growing up. The Newfoundland of those times didn't change much through the beginning of the 20th century. The feudal truck system between merchants and fishermen put the fishermen in a constant debt situation. The merchants sold all the necessities, food, fabric, fishing gear, but they were also the buyers of the fish. So the merchants set the price of fish and set the price of necessary items so that the fish take was just always just under uh, what you might need for supplies. And if you had a bad season, as sometimes would happen, there was a little forgiveness for that. Uh, here's a letter written to my grandfather uh, foreclosing on his fishing gear because his catch the previous year was not valued high enough to keep it. My mother was born the year before, the seventh of what would be nine children. That's mom in the middle there uh, with Mrs. Jokes just behind her to the left. When my mother was 14, Joey Smallwood came around arguing for a shift away from the impossible British-imposed commission of government and away from the independent rule that would leave the country of Newfoundland again in the hands of the merchant class who would continue to set the price of fish. Canada was then under the governance of Mackenzie Help Those Who Cannot Help Themselves King. <laughs> he offered a social option that put the good of the people above the greater earnings of the few. Here was an opportunity to be a part of a country whose currency was not valued and revalued according to the size of your catch. You can see why Mrs. Jost was on board. If you don't believe the vote was rigged, even pro-Confederates like me do, <laughs> but a lot of people believe that vote was rigged, the vote is that we freely, uh, we, the word is that we freely voted to join Canada 48 to 52 percent. We gave up our nationhood and as our local became provincial, so did our name on the map. And the country of Newfoundland became the eastern coast of Canada. We were fully recontextualized, standing no longer onto ourselves, but as the part of a wider family, all together welcomed, celebrated, ignored, and antagonized, just like a new little brother should be. How can we fit in? Canadians were mystified by our accents, our hobbies, and our clapboard colors. And as we arrived to our new country, like a boatload of immigrants from the East, we began a frantic shedding of self. Thirty years later, it was the artists who recognized what we had lost, and it was the artists who started a cry for the cultural revolution to get some of that self back. In a great plot twist, the greatest catalyst for that revolution came with a gift from the mother country herself when the CBC produced a series of television shows out of Newfoundland. They reflected the culture we knew and celebrated it shamelessly. It was Canada, to whom we had curved to fit, that was key in our readjustment of how we viewed ourselves. We had to be seen nationally in order to see ourselves locally. In our newly discovered pride, we became our own celebrants in service to the Church of Newfoundland. To speak ill of the place was akin to blasphemy, and we baptized you into the club with a foolish kiss the cod ritual that was actually invented in the latter part of the 80s, purely for the sake of demonstrating that our club was one that you could belong to, but not really, not really. <laughs> Just how so many 65 years ago felt about our invitation to sit at the table with the rest of Canada. Come aboard, but not really. I don't feel that way. Some people do. This determination we have to continue to set ourselves apart so there's one aspect particularly kindly, and that is when our artists make a go of it on the national or international stage. We are behind them 100%. Newfoundlanders on Canadian Idol were guaranteed votes from Pats and expats and Marys and ex marys Going to concerts on the mainland for Newfoundland bands like Great Big Sea and The Once is like being at a crushing kitchen party at Christmas, all the crowd happy and not homesick for once. We view this kind of artistry completely subjectively, unable to distinguish between the art and the home base of the people who make it. If the government wants to build our nation's pride and a league of arms-ready defenders for our country, build up the artists and the Olympic teams. There's a fierce battalion to contend with when a non-national points out what's wrong with Leonard Cohen or Sidney Crosby. Now, here's a funny antithesis to this thesis. When the non-local 
and the non-national celebrate our countrymen, we treat those artists even better at home. The truth of it is, music groups and theater producers have a better time of it at home once they've made it on the mainland. It's the truth that Newfoundland musicians sell better in Newfoundland once they've made it in Toronto. And it's the truth that musicians in Toronto sell better when they're uh, gone to New York. And I don't know where New Yorkers have to go to have made it. I suppose what they say about the place is true. <laughs> Strangely, the more global the sell, the more likely artists are to be acknowledged in their hometowns. A response to an artwork is subjective. And art that is of a place is more relevant to people of that same place. Doesn't it make sense that a cultural product that comes from your community should be more important and subjectively valuable to people from that community rather than one that comes from a culture far away? Yet we wait for approval of our local art and artists from our national and international peers. And when they say our artists are okay, we say of course they're okay, they're, they're our own, you know. And then we go out and buy a CD from, the, from them for the first time. Why do we need to be told what is culturally valuable to us from the outside? From years of being regarded in the context of our older, more populated and prolific British and American culture providers, we have an undeserved low opinion of our own cultural value as Canadians. I was once sitting in an, audience on London's, in an audience on London's West End waiting for a new British play to begin. A man excused himself in a distinctly Canadian accent as he squished by me to get his seat. We got to chatting and he revealed that he was from Ottawa. He'd been coming to England and Ireland for almost 20 years to see English and Irish productions. I told him that I was from, Ar uh, from Ottawa, which is where it was useful to be from at that moment. <laughs> And uh, that I was a curator and purator, purer, pur, purveyor, oh my God, uh, that I was curator and purveyor of excellent theater just down the road at the National Arts Centre. He could save himself a lot of money by getting his theater fixed just down by the canal. No offense, he said, but I come all the way to here to see English and Irish work because I don't like Canadian theater. Once you've driven a Mercedes Benz, you really don't want to drive a Ford. He said that to my face. <laughs> the curtain raised, I boiled in my seat. Is this how our countrymen see our own culture, stories, and artists? I recalled Mrs. Laureen Harper telling me, oh, I'm not the theater file in our household. Stephen loves it. He goes to New York for theater weekends a few times a year. <laughs> Now, we can all go around feeling persecuted about that. I did for a little while. <laughs> but then we have to acknowledge a human truth that was fully realized by genius violinist Joshua Bell in, pa in partnership with the Washington Post. As an experiment, he set himself up to play some of the greatest works for violin in a subway station just outside the concert hall where people were spending $250 a ticket to hear him play that night. Joshua and his Stradivarius made $32 and change. He's there for a couple hours. The experiment was to investigate a context for artwork and to see if people, even the sophisticated, educated workforce in Washington, were able to distinguish masterful artwork from irrelevant noise without being told to pay attention, without being told to listen. I implore you to listen. There are cultural products that could be feeding into the global expression of our generation happening in our communities that are not being heard because those communities don't appreciate the value of their own artists. Those artists cannot continue on to feed the greater global expression. And I believe communities are waiting for approval from somebody who can tell them from the outside that their own artists have value. There are a few iconic art Canadian artistic products, and these were rallied around by a community first, and then propelled into international stardom. If we just waited around for the monolith of American culture to feed our ears and eyes and souls, there would be no tragically hip, fiercely owned by Kingston. 
No bare naked ladies, claimed by Scarborough. No Sloan belonged to Halifax. But maybe Arcade Fire would still belong to Montreal. Montreal and French Canada recognized always the value of their culture. I would say that they're the exception in Canada. These examples that I've given you are from the world of music. Music is a form that can go from local to worldwide just by increasing your distribution. The theater is another beast altogether. Theater as a form that can only be enjoyed by people on a local level is different. It's the unending tail chasing of my job at the National Arts Center, insisting to Canadians that Canada has interesting stories to tell. Theater works are local, and unless they hit one of two places of world prominence, Broadway or the West End, most theater audiences won't have heard of them and therefore they won't go to see them. Even though an audience member's experience of the world is much closer to that of a local writer, many of us have a colonialist attitude to recognizing greatness. But the strange thing is, it's us who are in the colonies looking out at, for the stars. We allow people who know nothing about our communities and our experience to be our tastemakers. My petition is to drive communities to not reserve their night out to only when the Rolling Stones are coming to town or for a Broadway musical, but to check out their local venues, to see what their own artistic communities are producing, and hear the value of their own voices and points of view. I've heard the argument that communities don't have enough local artists to make a go of a local artistic product. Imagine if London had an environment so robust and so healthy that Rachel McAdams, Ryan Gosling, and Victor Garber always lived here. Can you imagine the production of Hamlet that would happen on the grand scale? <laughs> and even better, can you imagine if Emma Donahue wrote the script? And what if it wasn't about the story about some European and he screwed up royal family, but it was about a guy who got laid off from the Caterpillar factory and then won $13 million in 6.49? That happened here, <laughs> that happens here. So we have the stories to tell. This isn't to crush greater ambitions. A lot of people live between the two worlds, the local and the international. And I believe the international and the central, they benefit from the greatness of the locals and they get better because of the good of the regions. It doesn't mean that you can't have ambitions to go beyond your local. But it does, it does mean that communities who embrace their artists see more of them feeding into the centers and then returning home and feeding back into their communities with new ideas. The past few years, I've worked between three companies, the National Arts Center, the Stratford Festival, and Artistic Fraud of Newfoundland. I believe my work at the National Arts Center in Stratford is better because of the work I do in Newfoundland. I worry sometimes as somebody whose actual job it is to endorse what I subjectively feel are the best works of Canadian theatre. In representing the national, are my opinions having an effect on how regional artists and audiences regard their own work? The value of culture needing to come from outside appraisal? I'll tell you, it's for real. If a Newfoundland company gets a good review from our hugely experienced local reviewer, it increases our ticket sales. But if a show gets a good review from the teenager who writes for the Globe and Mail, look out. My mother just bought up all the tickets to scalp on the street. Can't get near it. While its proximity to Toronto has sucked a lot of local artists eastward, there has been a lot of cultural product that has come out of southwestern Ontario and the artists who live here. In the theatre, these are the plays that echo the words and worlds of farmers and homesteaders. There was a unique mode of visual art that belonged only here in southwestern Ontario, including one of Canada's pioneer artists, Jack Chambers. When asked why he returned to live in London after returning from Spain, instead of heading back to Europe or even the less established but more established than here culture houses in Toronto, the artist replied, it was a feel for the place that produced my intention to stay on in London. It was also my hometown and there were spaces here along the river and in the landscape that had become mine years ago and continue to be so. As residents of London, you know Jack Chambers Highway and your own voice and eye is echoed in his. I propose that his work has more value to you because you know that source material 
you understand better than anyone from any other city in the world, his artistic statement. Jack Chambers became a part of an artistic movement that I was surprised to learn about myself in researching for this speech today, London Regionalism. The movement was composed of a group of artists who acknowledged that London, Ontario was the center and subject of creative activity for them, who acknowledged yet refused to situate themselves in an art world of the metropolitan center. Art historian Terence Heath wrote, in the late 60s and 70s, Canadian artists and writers from coast to coast embraced the belief that art can only be made out of the specifics of life, place, and time. It is not that they rejected all art made in what is called art centers per se, but they rejected the right of any person or group to prescribe what art should be. They sought out and found in their own lives and localities the stuff of their art. Could James Rainey's poetry and plays have come out of any place in the world except for these parts? Could the work of Alice Munro have exhaled so much of the crystal blue breath of southwestern Ontario but that she was of this place? When I read the beautiful work of Alice Munro in something like Dear Life, it situates me right here in your place, a place I'm getting very familiar with, but not a place that's in my own bones, that's deep in my bones. Dusty farmhouses and cornfields don't belong to me, and when I love her work, it is as a very appreciative tourist. But when I see a painting by Mary Pratt, who has made Newfoundland her muse, her view of the world sets off not only an admiration for aesthetic and humankind, but a loud and resonant singing in my memory. Her, and viewing her work is like sharing the same dream, her and I, in that moment together. Of course, when I'm in Europe, I become a Canadian and Alice Munro belongs to me too, a part of the wider circle of Canada that I call home. From that foreign vantage, Alice Munro strikes pride in me as well as I. You locals here who have driven Jack Chambers Highway and met the descendants of the Donnelly's murderous neighbors, you are steeped in a culture, so you are ma ideally made to consume it. Think of this, where do you get the best Italian food? In Italy. What is Italian food? Flour, tomato, basil, rosemary, oil. Can you get this at the Loblaws? Yes. <laughs> but why does it taste so much better in Italy? Because in Italy, the scent of rosemary and basil is in the air because there are squished tomatoes on the road. All day long, your smeller is being tempted and coaxed and wanting it and wanting it. And there on your plate, the, walking up right out of the very earth you've been walking on. It makes sense that artwork that comes out of a particular culture should be enjoyed best by that culture. It is the 100 mile art diet. <laughs> Part of the monetization of art makes us a success only if we reach great masses of people. Prizes in the arts are often given out based on numbers of audience vote. Even the artist of, uh, Artistry First Canada Council gives points for more sizable audiences. It seems crazy to buck this trend. Wouldn't it be better if Sarah Smith was playing concerts to thousands instead of tens and hundreds? Bigger is better, right? I'd like to propose that the artists who have the widest appeal, those who address the masses and bring us together as a nation and a world, are inspired by and and bring with them their own local culture. They are fed by it. To that end, we must recognize the value of the artist who is a specialist in serving his own people, in creating and feeding back into his own community. Often the missing step, that is, uh, often the missing step is connecting our outward-looking local audiences to our inward-looking audi uh, artists. How many people do you know who've seen a show on Broadway? And how many people do you know who've seen a show by a local playwright about this community? When I was a kid, all I wanted was to work in Newfoundland theater and to be a part of our provincial and national dream. I went to school on the mainland, like you do, but all with the intention of coming home and working there. And along with that small seeming ambition, I housed another lifelong dream, to create a great work for the largest show on the planet, the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. The two went hand in hand for me, 
and making a living creating theater in Newfoundland seemed just as improbable as the other things, so I pursued them both equally without doubt or fear. With the community at home, I was able to develop my first big pieces, all based on a way to create theater using grids and music notation to move people about on stage, just like they do when they create those large choral movement extravaganzas that launch the celebration of brotherhood that the Olympics is supposed to be. I love that ideal. I still do. I wanted the power of a large group, all with the same intent, working together to create image and form to help story, tell a story the way the Greeks knew held a power, the way that churches know it holds a power, and the way that armies know it holds a power. I wanted to blow audiences away with the singular actions of a vast chorus. It was my determination to be such an expert at choral dramaturgy and choral movement that there would be no option but to hire me out of the Goulds, Newfoundland, to choreograph the opening ceremonies of the next Canadian Olympics. The likelihood that St. John's would ever play the host was nil, so both Toronto and Vancouver seemed like contenders for 2010. And thank God for you, Joey Smallwood, I got to make a go of it. Vancouver got the bid. I put together high-end portfolios and videos to send to the head of the cultural component who managed the ceremonies. I told everybody in the world that I wanted this so badly, and I made sure the word was out there, and I said it to everyone, and this, my friends, was before the secret, so. <laughs> in July, I got the phone call. Could I come to a brainstorming session in Montreal about the passing of the torch to Canada during the closing ceremonies of the Turin Olympics? It would be me, somebody from Cirque du Soleil, the guy who choreographed the Calgary Games in 88, and Robert Lepage. <laughs> Could it be true? My dream was coming true, and it was so easy. I just worked and put it out there. So I planned, and I dreamed, and I sketched, and I was already going to be in Montreal because I was teaching all of that choral work I'd worked so hard to be expert at, at the National Theatre Schools anyway. And I went to the meeting in a very fancy hotel, and I checked my armpits and my breath, and I sat at the table as a player, a real global player. And the good people who invited me to that table shook my shaky hand, and the discussion happened, and I offered nothing. I wanted to put my ideas on the table, and suddenly I lost confidence that I wasn't just good for local. The argument I am making to you today about the value of the local is one I should have made to myself. In that moment, my large-scale work that happened in Newfoundland was not legitimate enough. I stopped believing in my designs and, what, and that they were what needed to happen in Vancouver. And even if I was successful in my own community, why do a crowd of Newfoundlanders who paid 12 bucks a ticket know about the evaluation of real art? I lost my legitimacy to myself. The organizers of the meeting spotted my defeated spirit in an instant. As my heart and tongue became one terrible, unwieldy organ, they spared me the suffering of trying to articulate my parochial ideas in this room of giants. I went back to the theater school that day to resume my teaching schedule, and I put on a happy face for this gorgeous group of students I was working with, and the head of the school pulled me out of class, just as though I was a student myself. She brought me to her office, and she had a fresh pot of tea brewed. How is that, she said, and I cried, 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 and I did not cry, and I cried some more, and then I cried again. The Olympics only comes to Canada every 20 years. This was my chance. I blew it because I didn't believe I was big enough or important enough or global enough to do it. The global part of my life's ambition had disappeared, abandoned and lost. So I decided to do something really local. The most small, most local thing I could do. I called my husband from Montreal. Let's have a baby, I said. <laughs> it all made sense. I'd been teaching choral work I'd been developing for years and years. And, and I just loved the young people. And as every year I aged, and the class of uh, first years always stayed 18, it was getting more and more plausible that I could be their mother. The idea of it was delightful to me, generating one of these brave new hearts going out into the world. Unlike Sophocles and my own mother, I believe the children of the next generation are far better prepared for us for, 
per better prepared than us for empathy, for education, and for the determination of right from wrong. Many of the students I've had over the years give me nothing but hope, not hope, relief. Of course, this all occurred to me a lot late. Uh, I was already 38. When my husband and I started courting, he was already equipped with two young children and a feisty divorce in process. Had a vasectomy a few years back, and uh, having children then for me was really out of the question. Besides, who has, who has the time? Uh, so when the alarm finally went off on that biological clock, I'd hit the sleep button a few too many times. Uh, but a doctor sat us down, and she said, Don can try for a reversal, she said, but at your age, if you want a baby, you might try in vitro. Very space age suggestion, I thought. What's the cost? There's no clinic in Newfoundland, so you'll have to get it done in Calgary. Uh, with all of the travel, hotel, drugs, procedures, probably eighteen to $20,000. She asked our opinion. Don, Jill, CIBC. <laughs> Everybody at the table was consulted. Don and I agreed, CIBC said no. With global and local dreams being abandoned left, right, and center in one part of my life, in another, things were working out quite nicely. Back on the boards at home, our local theater created for the community was becoming national. Word was spreading about our work, and a few of our choral productions took hold and started to tour widely. These, this newfound notoriety started paying some dividends for our theater company in the good growth of local audiences, the way it tends to do. Is our local universal enough to suit the mainland? Then our local is good enough for us. Then we did a production out of the tiniest, most localized theater destination in the universe, Cowhead, Newfoundland. Smack in the middle of the northwest edge of the northern peninsula, peninsula population 474. This was a commission, a tribute piece, built around the story of the nurse who delivered all of the babies and provided all of the medical aid around those parts for 40 odd years. Not only was the potential of this story frighteningly undramatic, it featured a martyr-like British central character who had no apparent faults or vices. Brave British nurse comes to small town, fixes people, settles down. It sounded to us like a commission for a walk-in clinic version of CPAC. <laughs> the play, Tempting Providence, was to be built for the 87-seat uh, stage in Cowhead with an eye to maybe touring it to the old age homes around the locale. <laughs> we made the show as simple as we could and created it for an audience base only from Newfoundland, only from northern Newfoundland, a remote part of Newfoundland at that. The writer, Robert Chafe from the Ghouls, stuck to a 40-mile diet for character names and turns of phrase, and strung together the real events that happened over that cold coastline. Well, it turned out that the ailments that she encountered, from hand warts to gangrous legs, were a little more dramatic than we thought. In the end, it toured to 198 cities across six countries, and it played 651 times. Even did a decent run here at the Grant. What was incredible to us was how people from all over the world recognized it, identified it, understood it, and related to it. This was a show so specific to its community that it couldn't be, shouldn't have been able to be understood by anybody from St. John's, much less anybody in San Francisco or Tasmania. It confirmed to us that the local is the global. Examples like the nurse from Tempin Providence also serve as a proof that even in what looks at first glance like a general story we've heard before, special exists if we're willing to look at the local and see what is singular about ourselves and our communities. In the offerings for the Olympic opening ceremonies, artists are charged to create pieces that celebrate the unique culture of the host city and country. The local is drawn on. Olympic cities that have had the best opening ceremonies are generally those that take great pride in their local arts and culture. It is true that I didn't participate in the opening ceremonies of the 2010 Olympics in Vancouver, well beyond purchasing an extremely expensive seat to them. However, I was invited by the government of Newfoundland to participate as the designer and director of one of the 10 provincially produced victory ceremonies. Each province was invited to have a short cultural showcase on one of the 10 nights of the games before they awarded the medals that evening. 
The idea was something that would bring local Newfoundland culture to the world in a way that would celebrate the us within the you. I proposed making a film that would showcase the best part of the running the goat dance, threading the needle. We called it threading the needle around the world. And the aim was to hit the five participating continents, each represented by one of the colors on the Olympic rings all the while teaching local global musicians how to play the tunes for the song. We started the thread in Newfoundland. I'm just going to narrate this for you. <laughs> These are our dancers coming through Newfoundland. And then we brought it to Morocco for the blue ring. And then we brought it through Prague for the yellow ring in Europe. And then we brought it to Japan for Asia. And then Australia. Finally, we brought the thread all the way to Vancouver. And um, that was Hey Rosetta, you heard in the background there. They were playing the soundtrack underneath. Um, yeah, it was a really big, big deal. Big deal. Um, we, uh, when I was negotiating my fee to produce the, uh, the show, they said, how much do you want to produce this thing? And I said, it takes the global to do the local. And I said, $18,000, $20,000. <laughs> So uh, there's the, uh, there's her first picture. <laughs> so this is our daughter Josephine. She was called uh, Mrs. Jose after my grandmother. The photograph was taken at the home of a woman from Ottawa who's a real Canadian Federalist. She collects all sorts of national paraphernalia, and this very chair belonged to Sir John A. Macdonald. So I like to think that this chair held the arses of the man who started our country and the namesake of a woman who helped to complete it. I owe them both, and I'll pay, them, I'll pay for it by continuing to promote the artistry that emerges from all of our own corners and our own regions and our own nation. Just as our artists point out the beauty and wonder around us, I will continue to use my post at the National Arts Centre to point back to you the beauty and wonder of your own culture and your own people. See what's right around you. It's not just good for local. Thank you. Yeah, um, wow, I would love to invite Robert Chafe 
uh, who happens to be here with me. Robert and I run this uh, company uh, in Newfoundland. He runs it now because I'm too busy. But uh, Robert, I wonder if you would address that because this is a topic that's really close to Robert's heart and he's actually just written an opera about that very subject. Do you mind, Robert? I can talk to that. Maybe I'll stand up. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, I'll come back here so I don't give you feedback. Uh, yeah, July 1st, when, before we were uh, um, part of Canada, and July 1st wasn't Canada Day in Newfoundland, it was Memorial Day. Um, July 1st marked the beginning, July 1st, 1916, 100th anniversary this year, marked the beginning of the Battle of the Somme in World War I. Uh, and there was a battle called the Battle of Beaumont Hamel, a little town called Beaumont Hamel in northern France. And uh, Newfoundland um, had raised, um, had, had sent soldiers previously to armed conflicts, the Boer War, etc. But this is the first conflict that we'd actually raised a national regiment. We were hugely proud of that. And uh, this regiment um, was called from um, a lot of uh, the, the, church, the CLB, Church Lads Brigade, a lot of the more important kind of organizations in St. John's. So it really represented the best and brightest, a lot of um, the best and brightest of our generation, of the, the young generation at that time served. Uh, and they had served in Gallipoli, and, and now they were back in northern France. And, and uh, the first day of the Battle of Somme, on July 1st, they were sent up over the edge and were uh, completely decimated out of the trenches. There was 800 in the regiment. And there, there were huge losses on the British side. I think the British lost 60,000 soldiers in those few, first few days. Uh, but the Newfoundland regiment was about 800 strong. Uh, they went up over, uh, and within a half hour, they were wiped out. Uh, and the next day, there were 68 that entered the roll call. The rest were either dead or wounded. And it became a kind of scar uh, on, on, on the province. A lot of historians will point to World War I, what happened, and who we lost in that battle in particular, but also the financial uh, stress of paying back our war debt for Newfoundland as the end of us as a country that would not eventually precipitate the end of our uh, giving up our nation. Uh, so in, in St. John's, um, July 1st starts with a very somber, uh, nine o'clock in the morning, a very somber memorial service where people show up oddly dressed in red with Canada flags painted on their faces because they're going to Canada Day celebrations later. And we kind of mourn um, not only the loss of these men, but in many ways, for a lot of people, the loss of the country. And then the sun goes down on that, and then there's fireworks, and people celebrate our new uh, history, our new uh, future in Canada. And yeah, I just wrote, um, I not talk too much about this, but I just, uh, uh, there's an opera company, unbelievably, there's an opera company in Newfoundland who's doing, uh, who commissioned, this is the actual first full-length um, opera piece set in Atlantic Canada. And I wrote it with uh, Calgary composer, Edmonton composer John Stasio, and it's about um, Thomas Nangle, who was the chaplain to the regiment after, after the Battle of Bowman Hamill, he was sent over to be the chaplain to the regiment. And uh, it's kind of his story uh, through the end of the war and his post-traumatic stress disorder and what happened to him as a, a kind of human story to uh, the scar that that battle was for Newfoundland. I assume that's what you're talking about when you're talking about July 1st. <laughs> yeah. That's July 1st in Newfoundland. So if you're ever in Newfoundland around July 1st, uh, it, it, it is kind of great to go and watch the ceremony. If you're there this year, it's going to be huge because it's the 100th anniversary. Um, so yeah. This is an observation rather than a question, but I, uh, I saw Tempting Providence at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And I, I remember as it started and, and developed, I just was overcome by this huge feeling of pride and ownership. And I almost wanted to tell everybody <laughs> that I was Canadian, <laughs> but I knew it was, it was Newfoundland. And I, probably in that week I saw 25 productions, but it's tempting providence that sticks in my mind, and I mean really specific memories and and uh, images of that production and the table and the sheet and the chairs and so on. It just stays with me specifically, not just as a kind of a general memory. Oh, nice. Well, thank you. That's really great to hear. Comments or questions?
How would you relate your role now at the National Arts Center to all these themes that you've been talking to us about? I believe that the National Arts Center can only be strong if the regions are strong. A lot of the work that we do there is, uh, is, is purchased work, so we, I travel the country looking for work to bring into the National Arts Center. So um, I do, uh, it, this, this year for example, uh, it was a fully Canadian season except for we did, um, we did Twelfth Night uh, this year at the NAC, but besides that all the other shows were uh, shows that we brought in uh, to the, f that were from the regions, you know, from all over Canada. Um, yeah, I, I really believe that we can strengthen places like, uh, like the NAC that is a centralized place by having investment in the community. And in fact, one of the big development things that we do with our playwriting is we uh, find plays that are happening across the country and we work out uh, relationships with them. And then instead of having a development, um, the National Arts Center, we used to develop a play a year and we would de develop it in-house and it was kind of done there. Uh, but instead of that, we take uh, that money and we put it into work that's happening in the region. So we invest in a show. Uh, with the hope that that investment that we make will make it even better. Then we go to see the show and with that hope that that extra week of rehearsal or that great designer that they were able to bring in that we will get an even better quality show so that the NAC becomes a showcase for all the great work that's happening across the country. Yeah. And I wonder if you, I don't know if you'd be willing to talk about that, but I'm curious how that idea of local that you've been talking about today gets transplanted over to Stratford and working with a different kind of local actor using those Newfoundland local traditions. I just wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about what to look forward to this summer. Yeah, great. Uh, I can, and I'll tell you a little bit about the 12th night we did too at the NEC. I really believe um, if we're going to really be talking about Canadian culture, I'm, I, you know, and I see other people do great productions of Shakespeare and great, like, I'm a kind of theater file anyway. I, I go see lots of work and I was, you know, I did see that show in, in lots of shows in, all over the world really. I travel a lot to see shows. So I'm not against other people's shows <laughs> at all. And I think, you know, a great production of Hamlet that's straight up that looks like it could be from the Globe in London or it could be made here, also great. Like I, I fully support all performing arts, but I just, uh, I, I do like to see uh, um, more happening in what, what our own voices are. Um, so that production of Twelfth Night that I did, I said, I'm gonna do Twelfth Night, but I'm only gonna do it because I'm gonna bring in the, the old Trout Puppet Workshop from Calgary who have such a singular brand of theater that nobody in the world has ever seen really before. And it's their signature production. So what we did, and I kept insisting to my marketing people at the NEC, I was like, you have to not call it Twelfth Night, we have to call it Twelfth Night as imagined by the Old Trout Puppet Workshop. That's the title. So that it becomes a Canadian production of this show. And it was fantastical and it was, you know, set in Renaissance, whatever. You know. But that's not, that's not what's important. I, I just want the, the artistic voice of this country to be heard. Um, in, uh, you know, Shakespeare is funny because Shakespeare, <laughs> Shakespeare has gone from, uh, you know, you were saying you're proud as a Canadian to have this Newfoundland show in Edinburgh. We, should, we need to be proud as a world to have had, you know, oh, our planet produced Shakespeare. You know, so there's people who have transcended, you know, and, and so we own Shakespeare, you know. So the British people own Shakespeare, but Shakespeare is kind of one of those guys who's just transcended and transcended so that we all own Shakespeare. Um, but, um, but what I did with it, and I don't know if anybody saw Anne Frank last year too, an, an, um, an American, uh, writer did that production. But I really wanted to curve that production so that it spoke to us as Canadians, that it belonged to us, that the people at the beginning of the show who came out and said, I'm from, you know, wherever, I'm from Scarborough, I'm from uh, Timmins, um, in my school this is what happened. So, so that w we as Canadians could relate to that project on a, as Canadians, as modern people who live right now in Canada. Um, so with As You Like It, uh, if you know the play As You Like It, the debate is between the rural and the urban. Um, so in, uh, in that show, 
there's a basically there's a big upheaval in court, and uh, this Duchess Duke. I changed her into a duchess. But uh, this duke gets usurped and gets fired out. He has to go live in the forest of Arden. And while he's there, he disco discovers sermons and stones, books and the running brooks and good and everything. And so he sees, he discovers the beauty of the local. He discovers the beauty of the rural. He doesn't have to be in the city and be, you know, uh, consuming what we see it's my speech actually exactly my speech uh, because it's um, because all the stuff that happens in the court we have like kind of Van Halen music and then as soon as we go into the countryside it's Newfoundland folk music and um, all the actors are uh, so all the people who live in the country are, are kind of Bayman really and all the people who live in the city are just people from St. John's who are, have new oil money and the whole thing is set in 1985. Uh, and it's great fun, it's really, really fun. And the wonderful thing about it is that it's based on the, you'll see the set dance in it. But, um, but what's interesting to me is the overall concept and design, and I, people won't know this unless they read the program notes, but the overall concept and design is also based on Newfoundland culture, which is a participatory culture. The art that happens in Newfoundland, or used to happen there, uh, and it still does in a lot of communities, uh, it's not, uh, performative. Uh, when you're sitting, you know, they hear a kitchen party and this is where people learn to play. They're not playing for you. They're playing with you. So somebody's playing the spoons and somebody who's just clapping along. Or it's not me and you. It's us making this together. Uh, all the dance was never meant to be for show. The dance is made to be done, not performed. So it's a participatory culture and all of the artwork that came out of Newfoundland was participatory, not performative. So I, put, I brought that with me to Stratford in part of the concept. I can't believe they're letting me do it, but God bless them, they're letting me do it. So I said, okay, so everybody who comes into the show, because we're doing it in the big festival stage, and of course if you've been to the big festival stage, you know that if you sit anywhere, you can see, except for right dead center, you can see the other side of the people, right? And I said, well, what if we did like the Olympics and we give everybody a bag and uh, myself and the designer kind of figured it out. And we made, so the audience actually creates Newfoundland backdrops out of the things in their bag. So the audience comes in and they have, you know those fans that you get that open up like that, and you pin them to your, when you have a baby shower. Um, so everybody gets a blue one of those. And then everybody's invited to wear their garden party whites to the show. And a group of 16 uh, people from the audience uh, who, I don't know, you, you have to sign up early or whatever, but you, you learn how to do this dance that you saw before the show, because you dance it at the wedding at the end uh, with the actors, it's really great. And then, um, and then everybody gets these things, so, so you open up your, your big fan like this, and then I've got 1,800 people with these fans, and then I go like this, I go, just do this. And then we throw a light on them, and then we light the stage quite bright, and then they're all lit in this saturated blue, and then we fire this light up whale across everybody. And then the Rosalind and Orlando, instead of being, you know, just hanging out in the forest <laughs> as they are, they're fishing. They're fishing off a dock. So they fish there, and one of the audience members is spoken to in advance of the show, and they're given a, um, a fish with a magnet on it, and you, you know, you, we fish out, and, and the, the audience members do that. So, the whole thing, and I was talking to the uh, cast about it the other day, and I said, you know, because we, because it's all audience, it's not audience exposure the way audience participation can be, but it's audience embrace. It's not even audience engagement, it's audience embrace. And the whole thing that, if you know Rosalind's poem at the end, she says, I would, I, I she just loves you so hard, right? Uh, Rosalind at the end, she says, if you, if I was a man, I would kiss as many of you as there. And she just gives them this big hug. And I think, why is she doing that? They didn't do anything. But in my show, they're going to do something. So they're going to, she's like, oh, thank you. Thank you for making that show with us. Thank you. Did you have fun? I had a lot of fun. We had fun together. We made this show together. And I said to the, uh, the actors the other day, we were in the theater, and they were like, <laughs> going, so I'm going to shake this person's hand. I, yeah, find somebody who's friendly. You know, so, you know, it's kind of general. And then I said, the, the fourth wall isn't here for us. The fourth wall is out in the flower garden. Because it's not that there is no fourth wall. The theater just starts way out there. Because you're all, 
the audience. You're all the set. You're all in the show with me. So it's that kind of embrace that I'd like to kind of bring, that kind of, so that's part of the culture that I'm trying to bring to it. That sounds like a really cool show. I'm gonna probably make my, my friends come and see that. Yeah, make your um, friends sign up for the dancing. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I am representing Theater Western, which is uh, a drama group on Western campus, and um, at the very microscopic level, how would you say is, in your experience, the best way to foster that sense of pride in the local um, art scene? I think that it's organic, uh, but I think that we have to make an effort. So it's one of those things that uh, you know, social media makes possible now. Um, I think it's one of those things that we have to convince, you know, and I, and I know I'm speaking to the converted people who would show up to a lecture like this. I'm, I'm speaking to the choir, I'm preaching to the choir, I know. Um, but I think if we take the action to say, this is great, if we become the evangelists for our own work, if we become the evangelists for our own culture, uh, you know, uh, if you're somebody who's a, um, who's a, a donor and you, you give to, you know, National Arts Center or Stratford, I'm gonna be fired. You know, consider giving uh, to a local person. What if you, uh, what if everybody decided, you know, let's, uh, let's really support, um, you know, I think about Hey Rosetta, right? Do you guys know about Hey Rosetta, the band Hey Rosetta? I don't know. It really came out of, they were just university kids when it started. And they just were so embraced by the university community. I was hearing about them right away. I was hearing about them. And then suddenly it was like, you've got to see this band. You've got to see this band. And so it's about fostering um, a pride right from a local level. And I really believe that it's one of those things that people, if they hear you talk about it, you know, we have to be told <laughs> exactly what I said. You, we have to be told what's good, right? But if, you're, if you become an evangelist, if you as somebody who already cares about the arts becomes an evangelist for the art, then you say, you know what you just said, exactly what you just said, uh, I'm gonna bring my friends to that. And then if you, you know that old uh, Hannah Balsam commercial, yeah. <laughs> you know? It's just like, it just is gonna go and Facebook facilitates that and all those things. And doing things like using words that drive uh, people, uh, you know, uh, d saying things like, I was so proud to do that. People want to come to theater and events, like not even theater, events. The people want to come to performing of arts events and fine arts events, and they'll feel proud to have come. They'll feel excited to have come. They'll feel rejuvenated because they came. So if you feel like they would be proud to come, you know, that, that kind of thing will feed into things. And of course, there's all kinds of partnerships, especially universities. I know there's a lot of university people here. Partnerships between the university and, uh, you know, one of the things Memorial did, they're so, they're just like, we need the world to know that our artists are here and we are proud of them. So that relationship between the university, you know, and I don't call it, you know, it's not trivial, but it, it you know, it's, it's not, they're not ashamed of us, you know? A lot of artists are operating in a vacuum and then they don't feel embraced by their community and then they don't, you know, and it's, a, you need a very small critical mass to feed in and then, and then other people will come and other people come. I remember going to see the Bare Naked Ladies when I was going to Stuttgart Goal in Toronto and, you know, it was, it was 20 people, there was 50 people, there was 100,000 and then I couldn't get in anymore. Like I couldn't afford a ticket anymore. And that's truly how these things happen. But if you guys decide, you know what? I'm definitely gonna go see Sarah Smith. Sarah Smith, Sarah Smith, Sarah Smith, Sarah Smith. Yes, yes thank you. <laughs> you know, like it, if, you, sorry, I thought I had her name right. Um, yeah, like if, if people decide we're gonna invest in one of our own and really, really go for that, you know, you, you wouldn't believe how, bo how buoyant you can make that artist and then how much they can feed back for you, how much they can, how much, reward there is uh, from them back to you. You know, there's no reason that Alan Hocko should live in Newfoundland. He could go to LA, he could, he could be wherever right now. But he, he was so embraced and so um, loved 
that he bought a house in St. John's. It's crazy if you're like kind of like an A Canadian A-list actor and you wanna, you know, kind of make your and he goes down for pilot week or whatever, but he comes back home and he's part of he's part of it. So it really is about loving your peeps. Hello. <laughs> I just want to say, first of all, um, as a young person looking to further her involvement in theatre, I was really touched and inspired by your lecture, so thank you so much for sharing that with all of us tonight on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> so my question is, uh, you talked a lot about um, your involvement in developing new Canadian local theatre, and my question is, um, how do you capture mass audiences when there's such a focus on, you know, what you said, internationally renowned um, art, and how do you combat like a kind of stigma against local work to widen theatre audiences? This is my question to you. That's, the, that's what I chase my tail about all day long. So we have strategies. We have great marketing departments. Uh, we have, um, we tr sometimes we'll put a star into a show, uh, you know, just uh, because audiences are looking for legitimacy, you know. Um, but it's, it's a real problem. It's, it's going to be a problem until Canadians start to recognize their own artists and they start to recognize the value of their own stories. And, um, you know, again, you guys are preaching to the converted. I'm sure you guys do see that. But, um, but we're, we, have a, we have a very seriously uh, good producing uh, neighbor to the south there who wants to fill our, fill our heads, you know? And I just want to make sure that we have reserved some space uh, for us. Uh, but I don't know. I, I, I'm try we are trying. And we're doing it, you know, we have, uh, you know, a Blythe uh, Festival just got a nice uh, chunk of cash to help renovate their uh, venues. And I went there last year and the place was full, every show, the place is full. So, and Blythe uh, uh, specializes in Canadian work, they only do Canadian work. So uh, there's, there is, um, I believe that there is a, a passion for it, but it's, it's going to come with a lot of, a lot of different uh, levels of, Support. Yeah. We have time for one more. Excuse me if I don't stand up, but you just spoke to what I was going to speak to for Blythe Festival. And uh, London is about an hour and a half away from Blythe. And Blythe is not filled with people from London. Now, that is the most local theatre I have ever in my life seen. And I have seen some of the best theatre in my life at Blythe, mm -hmm. including Saltwater which they did beautifully, mm -hmm. and then I saw it in Newfoundland once too. But I disagree, it is not full all the time. Oh, okay, the, the, the weekend not is full. Okay. Weekends maybe, yeah. but there are days when that theater is not full, and it should be full, because it's one of the finest artistic expressions that our community could ever hope to have. It is brilliant much of the time. So I urge you to carpool. <laughs> Go. <laughs> it is so wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that that's the message is, is I urge you uh, to, to make a move towards something local. And that could include Stratford and that could include, you know, just going to see the performing arts. But because uh, but, there's great Canadian work actually that happens down there. But, uh, but Blythe Festival is a great, a great uh, it is really superb. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, Jillian for being here with us and uh, I mean I think her talk really rings true for all the arts. I mean everything she said is really applicable to, to all art forms, uh, you know, on an interdisciplinary level. So. Um, the conversation was very rich around uh, performance art and certainly applic applicable to everything else as well. So thanks to Jillian for taking time to be with us tonight. Um, and thank you to our partners uh, tonight who worked with us uh, for the better part of a year to, to get this going. It looks so simple, but it takes a while to organize these things. And Jillian has to make time out of her busy schedule for us. So it's wonderful that she was able to, to join us. Thank you very much.